Uh, next week, recording in progress. <laughs> it's recording into the cloud. Uh, next week is congregational meeting. So you'll get to be back there, but it won't be a forum. The following week is Memorial Day. And then there will be something on June 2nd, which I guess is really a forum, but it's probably going to be in the sanctuary led by Pastor Kim and Pastor Tom. And just uh, basically on the topic of dealing with change. Because as a world and as a congregation, we have just been through so much change in the last two or three years. And now, whenever their time is ending, um, that kind of stuff, I think it's important to hear about that. So that will be on June 2nd. Otherwise, then we will be um, off of forum until September. You want to be my slide person since I'm out here? <laughs> you can't live with them, you can't live without them. Yeah. yeah. He's had to wake it up. So I became chair of the chairperson, chair, woman, chair, something of the forum committee sometime last fall. And um, that was when George decided he wanted to focus more on the racial equity team and the green team. But amazing man that he has, he had a file of five years worth of forums and who spoke and everything. And so it was a, a fairly easy transition. We had a few new members to the team and and they were kind of asking, it's like, okay, what's our purpose here? What's our goal? What are the you know, forums? What are they like? And so um, basically the driver for us in forums is a uh, belief that our faith must lead us to action in the world uh, and our daily lives. And so forums provide education, experiences, ideas, resources that will assist us in taking it out the doors of, of our faith um, gatherings. And so our goal really is to explore a range of Christian thought and practice and look at needs in the world and figure out how they intersect, um, to educate us, to give us skills. Uh, so a part of that conversation or the ending of the conversation was about there's approximately a kajillion different topics that you can talk about in, um, in forum, different ways to present them, what do we do, or how do we make sure that we're doing a variety of it. And so we, um, can you change that? I guess it's stuck again. All righty. Well, if you can. Um, Owens, I'll get it going. Okay. Um, wow. So what we talked about is making a set, the yeah, flexible um, location of the types of topics and the types of presentations we might do, so that we were, you know, that we could touch as many different things as we could. And so um, we have been focusing on trying to make uh, first Sunday talking circles, um, second Sunday social justice uh, topics. Third Sunday, spiritual, theological, liturgical type topics. And fourth Sunday, um, life enrichment um, or experiential kind of things where members of our congregation share something that has been meaningful to them. And so we're going to just look at each of those things one at a time, and I'll remind you of things we've done in that, you know, in that kind of topic. Um, and uh, and then ask for your feedback if there are any of them that are really good. If you have um, suggestions to make them more valuable, and if you have ideas <laughs> of what we can do next. But before we go there, have you noticed this rotation or this framework? Um, do you have any feedback for us on how that's working? Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take a question. 
Have you observed then that um, every Sunday is a different mix of people or is there continuity? Um, a little of both. There, uh, there, we have had a good attendance almost every Sunday. Um, sometimes when it's, especially on the experiential things with like Sherry, when she shared her trip about the organs, this place was packed. Um, and so we think some of those presentations from members, there are people who might not normally come to forum, um, but they like those kinds of things. Um, you think some people are apprehensive about the talking circles, you know, that reticence of Lutherans <laughs> to... Uh, um, you're right. That's kind of uh, natural for Lutherans. If we could, once we get here, we try and almost belabor the point that no one's required to talk, um, that you can just listen if you want to, that uh, the stick helps you do active listening, um, and I guess we could put it in, at, uh, in a in a monthly announcement to a reminder of those rules of talking circles that um, you are not, if you're not comfortable, um, required, nobody's going to make you stand up and recite something or give your idea. Well, it also probably helps to highlight that there's a presentation so that okay. people don't think it's just a bunch of people jabbering. Okay, I'm not, right. that's as facetious. Yeah, and then, and actually you're, you're uh, voicing um, part of the attention of talking circles. We're really good at jabbering. Um, <laughs> we're, we love each other, we love to talk to each other, but this is supposed to be kind of focused that somebody prepares you for an idea, somebody gives you lead-in questions, then you have your talk, and if you really just don't have anything to say, you don't have anything to say. So, so that's perhaps a good idea, like next September, when we offer our first offerings to, to give a review of, of how talking circles work. Um, so I appreciate that. Yeah, it's possible that uh, by questioning the ignorance, asking a question, people can't tell them all the answer. Mm -hmm. Talk about what the talking circle is. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Uh, and we've tried really hard for those who come to keep explaining that, right. but, but for those who said, oh, I don't know if they're going to ask me to talk, I'm not going, we're not getting that message out, I don't think. So. Yeah, I'm saying for the uninitiated. Yeah, like, yeah. Not a familiar. Uh, so we will, uh, we will try to address <laughs> that um, before we get started in the following. This is just a question to kind of throw out. I was just wondering if there's sometimes, you know, because you had these first Sunday, second Sunday, third Sunday, fourth Sunday, all different, mm -hmm. would there be any um, validity in doing something a couple Sundays in a row on the same thing? It seems, to me, it seems sort of choppy. Okay. You know, and so in other words, um, I, I think back when, you know, uh, Pastor Tom was doing his presentation and he would do it and then there would be something else happening and then he'd do another one and, I don't know, maybe everybody's different than I am, but sometimes it's kind of nice to have a, a period of a couple of weeks or three weeks or something. I don't know quite how you would formulate that, but even with the talking circles, if you had a theme you were going with and you had a presentation, maybe then the next Sunday, you could have talking circle on that subject, you know, where people could, uh, Continue that. All right. We'll, we'll uh, put that on the agenda when we meet again. I think, you know, what you're saying, uh, how the conversation came up is sometimes we get really focused on this, and, and it's always this, and how do we create some variety? And you're saying, how do we create some unity and, you know, and so continuity? continuity. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I talked to Pastor Tom, he said, I could do this a dozen times. I've always got more to say on this topic. Just tell me when you want me to be there. You know, he's that kind of guy. Um, but but yeah, he would have you you wait a month or so. So yeah, because as I look at it, you've got you know social justice, spiritual formation, life enrichment. If you were, I'm again just throwing out an idea. You know, if you would do something like that a couple weeks in a row. And maybe you would make the second week at least part of it talking circle. Uh, 
you know, been talking to us about what you heard the previous two. So maybe you could do this instead of on a monthly basis, you could have it on an every two month basis or something like that, okay. right. where you had more of a sense of a flow. Okay. All right. I, I agree, Jen, because some topics lend themselves to multiple sessions. Mm -hmm. And whoever's giving it has to decide, you know, where to arbitrarily cut it off mm -hmm. when when you know it could go longer. Yeah. So that, that's we'll have to figure out how to yeah. incorporate yeah. And part of the reason we have you all here is like mm -hmm. I said, there's just so much you mm -hmm. can do. And how do we do this in a way that's meaningful? Um, and then of course the framework as we have it, we intend it to be somewhat flexible because sometimes you have a congregational meeting. And you just can't have a forum, or sometimes somebody else is planning an Advent breakfast. And, mm -hmm. and so we do intend it not to be rigid. Um, and so it might be based on the particular speaker. Um, yeah. You know, when is, the speaker, when is the speaker available? We have flip flop things when the speaker wasn't available. And so um, it's not meant to be cast in snap. But... So if you follow that uh, flexibility idea, if you use those four approaches as framework, but don't necessarily assign them to a particular Sunday. Yeah, I think that uh, that that is possibly part of it. We did that just to make it something our head could wrap around. Yeah, so what I'm saying then is like, yeah. okay, so we're going to have a series of social justice talks by Bill and Mike and Pete or Joe for three weeks, it's a spiritual justice topic, uh, and then later we're going to do some spiritual formation, and that's going to be one section of two, yeah. as opposed to first Sunday, first Sunday yeah. is talking. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I think this was a starting place for us to make sure we were broadening our scope and, and doing it, but we, we definitely can re-talk, and it might be by individual topic or speaker, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we've, we had, can, we've had some guest speakers who come, um, I used to be on the forum committee, but, you know, they do a series for mm -hmm. two, two or three. But, and I think that's what um, they're talking about with Pastor mm -hmm. Tom, you know, mm -hmm. he, he um, Pastor Tom's flexibility was helpful for us when we had some things like, oh, this, this guy can't come after all or whatever, and he's like, eh, I can do it. Um, so, so that was helpful as far as organizing and getting somebody in. But also two Sundays in a row, maybe three Sundays in a row, in a continuing presentation could be more cohesive. Mm -hmm. And okay. I'm not going to talk because I was going to say what these two wonderful people said. Okay. Yeah, I'll shut up. All right. <laughs> we'll just talk that as a third vote. That's a lot. Next slide. Yes, next slide. I heard when it wants to go, I'll do it. <laughs> so as far as talking to ones, we've already kind of gotten into this a little bit. Those were introduced in early 2023. Um, and they are a traditional First Nations format um, for discussion, problem solving, making a decision. And the basic purpose of it is to create a safe, non-judgmental place where each participant has the opportunity to contribute. And by doing that, you also just foster um, intentional listening um, mm -hmm. and, and hearing what people helps prevent talking over um, people or side conversations. And so that's part of what we could put in a newsletter, um, explaining what a talking circle is. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a good practice to those who want to speak. Anybody who has something to say is able to say it while everyone is focused on listening to them. So um, that's what those are. Um, let's see. Can you go one more? These, I don't know if you guys can read that. I have to put my glasses on and off because there's only certain distances the glasses work. But these are the talking circle topics that we have had since last September, just to sort of refresh your memory about the kind of things we do. So um, God's gift of creation and what it reveals to us about the nature of God, how we work for peace and love and unity in the face of powerful forces of division, how Advent makes us wait, and in the process turns out to be a meaningful preparation for Christmas. 
uh, the season of Epiphany and how all of those stories in the gospel about Jesus' life, one by one, like peeling an onion, reveal something more about God's nature. Um, preparing for Easter and a discussion on resurrection, um, speaking truth to power, and then the distinct different practices in celebration of Easter between um, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and various Protestant um, groups. So those are the topics that we came up with in that, that last year. And so you can go one more. Basically, these are the questions pretty much that we're going to be asking you for each of these four groups. Um, have they been effective in what they're intending to do, facilitate the discussion, strengthen listening skills, encourage participation? What did you like? We've talked about that a little bit. Anybody uh, share a story about a talking circle that they really liked and um, what might be more valuable? We've talked a little bit about that and any future topics for talking circles that you can think of. Some of us need to make our presentation shorter. <laughs> Some of us, no. So I, I can tell you one story um, on the resurrection um, talking circle that Phil did. Um, I don't know how many of you were here, but he talked about caterpillars becoming butterflies. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we all know that happens. But what I didn't know is inside the caterpillar are some dormant cells that the caterpillar never uses. Um, that caterpillar moves almost nowhere from where it's born. It's seasoned black and white. It's uh, a kind of a monotone color or a camouflage color. And it starts spinning that cocoon. And once it's in the cocoon, the dormant cells come to life. And the rest of the caterpillar's body um, fights that. Um, it doesn't want the, these cells to take over. But eventually, those are the cells that become the butterfly. So the butterfly has those same cells, but they're not dormant. They're active. And the butterfly can fly thousands of miles. It's all these brilliant colors. It, um, you know, and it's it, so cool. Huh? It's season yes. color. Yeah. And, um, and so the scientists who discovered these cells, and I just love this, they called them imaginal cells. And it's such a good description of resurrection. Imagine what you might be. Uh, when you are resurrected. And they did some studies um, where they uh, exposed um, caterpillars to uh, a strong smell and some kind of a, you know, shock or something like that. When they had gone through the whole process and became butterflies, the butterflies from those caterpillars avoided those smells. But the other butterflies did it. And you know, when you're talking about resurrection, we don't really know a, a whole lot about what we mean that, oh, you know, we're there's a, you know, we're gonna die and then we'll be resurrected and we're going to heaven, whatever that might be. But the idea of we're resurrected in this new, joyous, uh, colorful, new way, but yet we still hope hard we work. <laughs> that was just that was one of the documents for those who really spoke to me. Um, Anyone else, anyone have any ideas for parking circle topics? Okay. Well, I, I have Okay. I, I think we as a church, especially the leaders, need to be talking about how the church is changing um, to help people understand that the church of the 60s, 50s and 60s are not coming back. Because we heard um, quite a bit of that in the group conversations for the MSP to go, where are all our young families? Where are all the kids going to come back? And there's a lot of people that don't understand the society we're in today. So, um, you know, I, I think that education is important. Uh, because if you don't, there's frustration and there's anxiety because there's the fear that what's going to happen because we all know when we fill out the MSP, 80% of us are 65 plus. Yeah. 
That's that's what it came out. Um, yeah. I we went to our church before here, and we studied a book called Vanishing Boundaries. Okay, mm have -hmm. heard of the book? I haven't heard of the book, but I just want to make sure Heidi got that down because I, I have some books there too. If anybody wants to look at them that have been talked about, really, you know, you often learn a lot. Yeah, but the book Vanishing Boundaries and what that book is about is the Presbyterian Church took an extensive research on why we're losing memberships and we the mega churches are needy. Mm -hmm. And the premise there being that if an indicator of people sitting in church is if the head of the household, the father is a strong Christian. But it talked about why people are leaving, why people are staying, what are the needs that have to be fulfilled to the rest of the world to bring people to us. And I think if someone could get that book, read it, get the research on it, and present it to us. It would give us an idea of why we're not growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, we can look into that book. I think one of those lessons we learned is that how the megachurches are also shrinking. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to point out, the book that came out, gosh, at least 20 years ago, uh, Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone, um, bowling alone. Bowling alone. Oh, it's a matter of work. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he was studying it's called Bowling Alone, Robert Putnam. Thank you. Uh, his whole treatise is like we reached the peak of civic engagement in things like bowling leagues, mm -hmm. churches, anything social, Elks Club, what, in the early 1950s. So, first post World War II, big baby boom. That's when we built all these giant churches you see at downtown the Columbia. And shells now. Um, all civic uh, engagement is that across the board. It isn't just church, it's everything for a whole lot of reasons that we all can intuit. Uh, certainly, uh, television, the internet, you know, just our affordability of our, our culture, just a, so much has changed that you, you're exactly right. We're not, we're not going back. To, yeah. It's not going to happen. But <laughs> he does hold out some, some hope here and later in his book is stuff like why did this happen? So, you know, there's still opportunities to create civic so engagement. And you see pockets where that's happening. I mean, this little church is pretty healthy relative to most others around. Mm -hmm. And we can that's a topic for, for discussion. You probably have the forum we could have again. Mm -hmm. Um but there's an awful lot of the farm. Yeah. Um, and so understanding what those factors are and how you can just build on what you are and what you attract and don't worry about all the rest of that stuff. But going back to the 50s, where yeah, it, looking back. Mm -hmm. yeah, the looking back is not very helpful, other than to understand how to get here. And yeah. yeah. And even then. Right. Well, and again, uh, the church was community back in the 50s and 60s. We didn't have all the Right. I remember getting a television, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and there was no internet. To, so the church was community. Uh, so things have really changed. A couple things that, that connect to that and that um, is uh, on the Luther Seminary site, they have this Faith Plus Lead group, and they had an article there. I don't know the exact title, it was something about moving from the age of association to the age of authenticity. And so in the 50s, and when we were all growing up, hey, Randy, who are you? Well, I'm a Lutheran church, and I belong to the Lutheran church, and I'm a choir director, and I have, I'm part of the bowling league, and I live in, we, that's how we define who we are. And people don't define themselves. And I'm too old to exactly understand what this age of authenticity means, <laughs> um, exactly what they mean by it. But I have since heard that word multiple times, um, it, you know, somebody talking about, well, it has to be authentic. And so it's a place to poke into. Um, and Gary and I just read a book called Being Church in Liminal Times, meaning times of change. Mm -hmm. um, and it talks about looking back, memories, um, letting go, letting go, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so, uh, and it talks right in there that some churches never do talk about this. We don't have the conversation until the only option is letting go. And that's when you have a church turning itself into low income housing, which isn't a bad way to be church, <laughs> um, you know. And and but sometimes you can, and maybe that's maybe that's a way of actually resurrecting. So I think it's a really important topic. Well, it turns out <laughs> COVID taught us some things. Um, one is that social isolation isolation is really toxic. Mm -hmm. it, it's continuing to have. A, it's so that a lot of mental health problems. People have figured out that being together in the community is more important than they thought. Uh, we thought one of them that schools could move entirely online, but we learned from mm -hmm. that was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. So it's like there really is a value in having public schools and kids in classrooms right up through graduate schools. Mm -hmm. You know, so we learned some things. So I, I haven't given all, all hope of the churches going away completely. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to look different. Yeah, it could be that low income housing with the chapel inside it, where we meet on, you know, or something like that. But community is something this church does really well. Good example is the, the church at Fort Moj, the group I directed for several years. We've been performing for the last few seasons in Mason United Methodist, which is Rocker. It's a huge building, seat 700. I got a, I got a, a space just as big downstairs, uh, an education wing. I mean, imagine just the cost of keeping the lights on that place. And of course, all their wealthy benefactors who built that place in the 1950s, I think what happened, late 50s, early 60s, they're all dead and gone. They left some legacy. So they've got about four years of money left to make the transition. There was an article in the, the crib weeks ago, they're going to convert that space to a civic center, low-income housing. You know, they're already uh, reaching out uh, in multiple AA groups and so We go reverse now, there's always other people in the building. But for a long time, the place was just empty. Yeah, yeah. So it's, so those changes are back. And if that change also includes a chapel or a worship space, then those who are still part of the church can still be so we church there. Mm -hmm. So it's a big topic, I think. Um, okay, let's go on to social justice. We didn't really feel like I had to explain social justice to us. That is the key way in which we take our faith out in the world. We see what the world needs where things are are not right or loving, and our faith drives us to try and um, address those. And another thing that this church does very well, um, the topics that we have done since last September um, about uh, social justice are on God's work, our hands. Uh, Sunday, we wrote letters to our senators supporting reauthorization of the Farm Bill. Um, we had a session on the ELCA Truth and Healing Movement, and, and that was about understanding the doctrine of discovery and its effect on Indigenous people. And then as a follow-up to that, <laughs> we were going to do two in a row. <laughs> um, we wanted Mark Charles, who um, wrote a book with uh, Sun Tam Ra called Unsettling Truths, the Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. That has been our bumpiest road in the year that I've been on a forum committee. We had scheduled him right after that, um, and then something came up that we needed to do, so we had to tell him, can we schedule, reschedule you? So we did the first Sunday of January. Um, he was ready to do it, but got confused on our time zone. So he logged in to present to us an hour later than when the forum starts, and we were all heading out the door. So then we rescheduled him for April, um, and then he called George a uh, few weeks ahead of it at the time, and he said, so I want to start. I know I screwed up in January. I will be here to speak to you if that's the only choice we have. But I wanted to let you know that I have been just, we have just received an award for a documentary oh. album. And the conference where it will be awarded is that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so who's going to say no? You have to come and speak to us. Of course, that's that's how flexibility we need. And so he and George had a conversation, and they realized April is Earth Month, 
And George, of course, always has something in his back pocket. <laughs> and, um, and so he had this film called um, uh, the documentary by John Feldman, Regenerating Life, How to Cool the Planet, Feed the World, and Live Happily Ever After. And that was an amazing film. We only got to watch a part of it, but uh, a very good and very much match Earth, um, Earth Month. And so then they decided to look next fall. And the second Sunday of October, should that remain Social Justice Sunday, if we assume at this point it can, it is the day before National Indigenous People Day. Oh. Uh, so sometimes these things just slide in the way they're supposed to, and we are certainly hopeful that we will get to hear. You want to, um, I don't know. Okay. Um, some of you may have already read this book, but this is a, uh, Mark Charles' book, and it's about the doctrine of discovery and how it has affected Indigenous people. And it's really, it was really quite a uh, good book. But this is, it was starting with this book, is how we got connected to that topic. Um, so, Mark Charles, he's uh, been with us a while, and eventually we will actually see him via video. Uh, we also had an update on the Sparkle House. Um, the documentary, and then um, Heidi and Steve did a, a legislative update where they gave us information about how you can connect to the legislature, find out what laws are considering, which ones they passed, which ones they decided to go to a vote of the people, um, ability to talk to your legislators. Um, it, was, it was a very helpful and interesting talk on how we can engage as citizens in the legislative process. Process. Okay, so our former church was a Megaloo church. It was so big that they had two different adult educations that we could choose from either one of them. Um, but one of the things, choices, yeah. One of the, <laughs> yeah. And, but one of the things that we used to do from time to time is they would, the church would buy a series of videos. Maybe it took four weeks, six weeks, with an expert talking to us on a certain field, and we'd watch the radio, and then we'd talk about it afterwards. And I'm thinking that would be kind of a cool way to go, too, because it would have a bunch of speakers in, it's a series, it's what the Senate wants us to know. Okay. And I think that that's what, like, we have one on the book of Revelations. Lutherans look at Revelation. Oh, <laughs> that was Pastor Seth's favorite book. <laughs> uh, so, yes, yes. But what, um, but what, what he told us <laughs> it was that the beast whose name was number 666 was Nero. And Nero was already dead. And he pointed it out and mm -hmm. things like that. So, that would be a good, that, that, a series like that from the Senate, I would just love to come to. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we can put we can put that down. I'm sure the ELCA has um, resources too. So, any other stories, ideas, um, future topics? We have since I put this uh, put the this announcement in the newsletter. I have had many people come and give me suggestions. So I'm looking, I mean, that makes me really happy. So we've got a list going, um, but just wanted to know from you. Um, what, you know, are some, Jerry, what, were, what were some of the suggestions here? That is my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So before we go on, Jenny. Oh, I don't know um, if anyone here is familiar with a magazine, Christian Century. Uh, he gets a, the mm -hmm. subscription to it. it. It has some things in there that would fit into social justice, some into the faith formation one. In other words, they're always current topics okay. that are, you know, potentially there. Yeah, I and you know. use the magazine as a resource, or is it also a place where you can get a video or something to show? So it, every article is going to be different, you okay. know. So you're going to have some will be people like who've written a book or okay. you know done a documentary. Some will be just articles. Uh, it's it's really varied, okay. but it might be a seedbed. For right. some ideas. and that's that's what the books have been is a seedbed for us. Yeah, that idea for some of them. I subscribed for about 15 years. 
I was assuming I'm a pastor, I'm not obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but most, most people who subscribe apparently are. But it's a great resource because they're you know, it's current. They're really on top. I, I found a lot of times they're way ahead of uh, the rest of the media. Um, well, they're asking so important questions from, from a spiritual yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. And what was the name of that? We call it a liberal bias, uh, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of, well, cross <laughs> cross denominational. Yeah, well, and Kathy mentioned already too. Uh, the Luther Seminary has a lot of resources because yeah. they're they're on top of this, and yeah. it's called faith uh, and lead, faith plus lead, or faith cross lead. <laughs> yeah, well, it could be a cross, but mm -hmm. endless. Yeah, so that's a good source too. But we yeah. can we can look into that that publication. Well, let's you know what's going on. <laughs> In other churches, too. Well, yeah. Like, see. What's what's happening? What's up with the Methodists right now? Or, so, uh, you know, so they're telling you that stuff. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Let's go on to spiritual formation. You might know that this, you know. Oh, I guess we already asked our question. Anything else on social justice? We then. Yeah. How do we put it into practice? We can learn about it all we want, we can read about it all we want. Mm -hmm. Uh, how are we going to make a difference? I think sometimes our social justice um, topics have been talking circles. Sometimes the speaker has things, but we also have a racial justice team, a green team, and some groups here who are actively working for exactly that. Mm -hmm. uh, Phyllis is one of them. George, uh, in the past, not this past year, academic year, but previously, has done an enormous uh, contribution to our church in understanding the doctrine of discovery and how that sounds like, well, gosh, that was back in the 1400s, about how much that affects today's uh, First Nation people mm -hmm. and others um, that are not uh, the white immigrants from Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think every year when, um, like, is it November, is uh, Native American up? Well, I know Native American Day was in October. But I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, National Indigenous People. But, it, but you know, I, I just feel like it has influenced my thinking continuously mm -hmm. and understanding of some of the oppression that has been ongoing and is generations and generations mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. And about the boarding schools, many of which were uh, supported by churches. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I think that 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 kind of thing, mm -hmm. even if you know, maybe you can't say that caused me to do such and such. It it causes a shift in your thinking mm -hmm. that I think is quite powerful and a level of awareness uh, mm -hmm. somehow or another. And maybe uh, to a certain extent, it was prior to having a web and social media and stuff, but we were able to walk kind of with blinders on. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think if somebody had stopped and talked to us, you know, in 30, 40 years ago, we might have said, "Oh, but." But it was easy to plot along in life and not know this. One action was the three Puyallup uh, poster signs that we have yeah. outside. Mm -hmm. And also in November, the Linz of Mattis banner that honored um, the Canadian children who were uh, killed uh, or died mm -hmm. in the Canadian uh, boarding schools. And our signs of the along Peacock Hill that. Yeah. Help, uh, yeah. 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 So there have been some action. I think if you start with learning, that raises your awareness, and then that can lead to to I brainstorming. Think, I think a tougher one. You can you can get overwhelmed. Uh, yeah. Social justice question. Uh, for me, I've had to just kind of pick my target and say, you know what, I care really care about. I'm willing to spend time, energy, and money on this, yeah. and the rest of it. Yeah, I, I hope that people are going to work on that, but I'm going to work on this. Right. And it's I, okay. I, I do think that's true because you could run yourself so right in that you have to got nothing done. You have to say, this is a big deal of a name for me. And here's what I'm for our work. And we've read in book group, book club, we have read some phenomenal books on social justice. Which I find more helpful than a talking start for me to read a book that goes more in depth than we can hear. 
I mean, how do we get more people reading? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, they, I think they have different purposes. One of the major purposes of a talking circle is in, to increase our confidence in speaking and in listening. Um, and maybe then you go and find a book to learn more in depth from it. But, but as Lutherans, we're kind of famous for not being verbal about what we think. And so this is meant to create a safe space where somebody can blurt out an idea and nobody's going to roll their eyes or start talking to their partner and that you can listen and say, what's the value in what this person is saying? All right, spiritual formation. Now that looks like a really tiny list, <laughs> but please note that the middle uh, line, the Lutheran understanding of scripture and faith happened four times. So if I had written that line four times, <laughs> <laughs> it would look a little bit more like the other slides. Also, by just random roll of the dice, because we were trying to follow this framework this year, um, spiritual formation landed on the third week, which means we cannot do it in November and May, because those are congregational meetings. Um, so again, if we start trying to change a little bit, maybe pack two Sundays together or something, that might change. But in fact, we had six sessions of that. I'd like to know what... People pray that first line says because I'm going through the Bible in my head right now. Um, and I'm trying to figure it out. I don't know if we still have the um it's it's still online. Is it still yeah. online on yeah. it was a, it was an excellent presentation about it doesn't say anything about same sex marriage. No. No. We'll talk about the, the presentation built it on that was wonderful. The what? Yeah. If it, it's online on the um YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Well, they say five, five, same sex nothing. Um, the, the Bible has either five or seven, I can't remember the number of verses that people use. They call them clobber verses. Mm -hmm. uh, they stretch their interpretation to say that it can't be. And so this was education on, oh, like taking um, the second commandment, like breaking the second commandment. Uh -huh. the, the, the verse in Romans where Paul made up a word. Um, and I, it was great, so I, I can't pronounce it, but um, in the presentation, they said, it's kind of like the word understand. Under means below, stand means stand up. How does understand mean, I get what you're talking about. You know, he had made up a word like that. Um, there really was not found anywhere else um, other than Paul wrote, but people have, um, taken these verses as if they were written in 21st century English um, and don't understand that some of those proper verses are talking about pedophilia or um, boys who are prostitutes in, in the temples, that kind of thing. And yeah, so that just right. helps us be a little bit more verbal on the topic because there is a lot of homophobia in our country. I know something I would love to listen to, and that is the women in the Bible who are mentioned, whose names come before their husband's name because the women were the head of the household in those households. Yeah, who's the... That would be, yeah. it was always Mary and Joseph, not Joseph and Mary, mm -hmm. Lydia, the seller of purple, and her husband wasn't even important enough to have put his name down. Mm -hmm. And then Priscilla and Aquila, because Priscilla was the head of the household. She employed her husband and she employed the apostle. Yeah, well, I'm going to go looking for something. Else. Yeah, so look about how women were not always suppressed in the Bible. We could be the head of the household if we were the more common person. Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. I want to say I'm at the end Priscilla because she runs our household. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so any, we've gotten some ideas, any other ideas on uh, spiritual formation that somebody's just thinking about? I have received the, um, some suggestions on that. Okay, so on to the experiential or the life formation. I guess I have the, the questions, but we all know what we'll five now. And uh, um, okay. yeah, we've spoken on that. So one more. So these have been 
things that members of our congregation, um, the experience they had, a trip they had, a book they read, something that was really meaningful to them that they have shared with us, which kind of expands how we connect faith and how we may hear it in, um, in other things. And so the, the um, sessions that we had on that were, oh man, here, oh. Uh, Marilyn Collier did Why Does God Make uh, Keep Making uh, Poets? A uh, pretty interesting talk. She shared a lot of poetry and meaningful ways of, of understanding or, or meditating. Um, uh, the uh, Sherry and the Worship Committee did a forum on Carols and Christmas where they told us the history of the writing of some of our favorite uh, Christmas carols. And then we sang those carols while we decorated the tree out in the sanctuary. Um, uh, Sherry did her uh, travel of the historic organs in Germany and Netherlands. How uh, people really liked that? That was one of them. And um, we had book reviews. Um, Phyllis told us about um, this book, The Amen Effect um, Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts in World, written by uh, Rabbi Sharon Rouse. Um, really, really good book about community and supporting each other and some of what Randy was talking about. Um, I thought it was interesting, maybe a week before last, because she's gone now, Rebecca Crow posted on Facebook that this author had been down at one of the protests about the war in Gaza. And she and the people that they were with, you know, you had the pro-Palestinian people, and then you had the people here, they walked right in between them and just engaged them in conversation and talked to them, and it, it very much calmed them. So this, this is a really brave woman who understands relationships and communication and support. Um, I went home and ordered the book that day. Um, and then um, the other presentation on that day was from uh, Laura and Molly and Neil. And Neil on a book we read in the book club. And um, that is Stephen Copperhead, which you may or may not have read. It is fiction, but it just opens a wide window into the really horrible effects of poverty and drug addiction and issues that are uh, in rural Appalachia. And so we have those. Um, and then Neil. Um, and then presented on his trip to Portugal with photos of you know ancient ruins, abbeys, sacred shrines that he saw. So that's the kind of things that we've been doing for these experiential things. And so we can hear from our own members about things they did that were meaningful to them. Um, so if you want to know, oh, there you go, we got it. Again, any things that you remember that you remember a story to tell? Um, ideas for topics um, that would be good for people to share. Um, I'd like to have more of the, the book reports. Okay. Because I read a lot, but people in congregation read more than me. Mm -hmm. And they're reading really interesting things that I'd like to know about. Okay. I still think we need to do one on Christian nationalism as the election. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I see you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we are getting there. Okay, um, let's go on to that last, the last slide. So these are some of our topics that we're considering that people have suggested. Um, the Practicing Democracy Project, somebody has offered to do some sessions on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who is just a giant of the faith. Um, uh, Christian nationalism. And so um, Phyllis shared uh, one session that, that was done in a church that she visited, and then went, went on to the ELCA website. I think that's what it was, wasn't it? The website you gave me? Yeah. But anyway, they have a whole program on Christian nationalism. One of the books they recommended was this. So, of course, I bought it because, you know, but it's the Seven Deadly Sins of White Christian Nationalism. And so I think, you know, reading this book will provide that framework, that education to present on that. Um, where are we? Uh, artificial intelligence and faith. 
Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is going to blow our world up. Mm -hmm. um, we're going; it's going to change how we do it. How it connects to our faith, I don't know, but it was a suggestion. Um, we might need, we maybe we need to find somebody who's a little more expert than me on that. But it's an interesting topic. Uh, finding a new language for God is uh, kind of connects back to what Gary was suggesting. Came out of text study. Um, Pastor Kim brought a friend of his, a retired Lutheran pastor from Olympia, who is writing a book right now and talking about that there might have been some harm, some stuff that is not connecting with the patriarchal language that we use for God. Oh, and um, in talking about, and again, it was something that Pastor Tom mentioned in his sermon when he was quoting the guy uh, whose saint stay is in August, saying, you know, that love is the most momentous thing there is, and that's what God is, is love. And that's a little bit what this uh, guy was saying. Um, it's a tough, tough topic. Uh, it makes your head whirl, and it's part of your first reaction is like, ah, you know. So it might be more of a theology on tap topic or something, but but it would be interesting. Um, racism in medicine came from this book. Um, it's called Legacy, written by Uche Blackstock. She is a black female physician who is the daughter and the sister of black female physicians. And that is probably the most rare combination you could find in the world of medicine. But it's a book about her growing up with this mom who was a doctor in kind of an inner city hospital. And then as a med student, as a practicing physician, as a patient, where she experienced racism or, um, you know, things like uh, people not believing when she said, I'm in pain and that kind of stuff. And so now she's she's kind of um, trying to educate the world on, on what that's happening. So pretty interesting topic. Um, healthy congregations is something that there's resources in the ALCA for. Maybe goes back a little bit to this, um, how do we have to reimagine the church because we're not going back to the 60s? It's been a while. We did a lengthy series about healthy congregations yeah. okay. several years ago. Yeah, it would be interesting to know if there's updated information there. Uh, Women of the Reformation, the, um, that's not the Reformation, but a little kind of what Laura was talking to about women in the Bible that were um, more prominent than their husband. Um, African American spirituals, and then maybe, 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 maybe. <laughs> Um, <laughs> how do we welcome a new passion yeah. to our congregation? Um, and so that, that's I that's that's me being an optimist. <laughs> I'm like, this is gonna work out somehow. Um, but I do think we need to we will need to talk about that too. So that is really what I have this morning, unless anyone else has any more suggestions, statements, things they'd like to offer. Um you brought the good work. Yeah, thank you. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's that we've got a really good committee. They're creative. They're willing to pop up here and present. Um, many of you in this room have said, sure, I can do that. And we appreciate that so much, your willingness to come and, and share some kind of topic that is important to you or that you've uh, experienced or something that you think is helpful or educational. So we will be meeting again sometime in August and start up after Labor Day. And um, yeah, we'll Good. see where we can go from here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so if it's a